स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया गुड मॉर्निंग एंड दिस इज वॉट ऑल आर लेक्चर्स हैव बीन लीडिंग अस टूवर्ड्स द न्यू हॉलीवुड एंड वॉट वॉज दिस हॉलीवुड न्यू वेव सो कॉल्ड हॉलीवुड न्यू वेव एंड इन वन ऑफ माई अर्लियर क्लासेज आई मैंशन दैट इफ देर हैज देर इज अ न्यू हॉलीवुड दैन देर हैज टू बी एन ओल्ड हॉलीवुड एज वेल सो वॉट वॉज दैट ओल्ड हॉलीवुड क्लासिक हॉलीवुड ओके एनी अदर टर्म फॉर दैट गुड गोल्डन एज ऑफ हॉलीवुड एंड when you look at key concept that we are going to revise today so classic hollywood of course we will revisit very briefly today so remember what were the features of the plot how was the story told the narrative how were the characters sketched in old hollywood system what was the concept of stardom all about think close ups think photography think the acting style studio system you remember the studio system how studios controlled stars and everything that came with it the complete act of movie making editing style music so these are the key concept that we will be thinking and talk discussing today with reference to new hollywood but you should always be able to revisit classic hollywood also against this background because that's where we come from so what was the background of new hollywood uh there was a motorcycle club established in 1953 by rocky graves uh, it was called hells angels motorcycle club okay and they were known for their free spir spirited um, iconic and bound by brotherhood and loyalty tendencies when you watch a movie like Malin Brando's which movie we have, we have been talking about the biker movie the wild one okay when you think of the, the wild one came uh, somewhere in early 50s peter fonda and dennis hopper's definite seminal movie this is the movie that heralded the age of new wave hollywood easy rider okay and when was this released in 1967 okay but biker movies were nothing new we had the wild one and after that we had several b category the so called b movies of biker genre peter fonda himself starred in a movie called the wild angels which was yet another biker movie so that preceded this so peter fonda was anyway a biker you know a biker star as we call it so if john wayne was the ultimate western on a western hero on horseback okay here we had another kind of hero always on a bike so that and dennis hopper let me tell you hated bikes okay as much as peter fonda loved them you know peter fonda comes from Ho hollywood royalty his father is the great henry fonda and sister is another great jane fonda okay so that's his background so um, this is one thing that ushered in the era of uh, uh, the new hollywood movement so why are we interested in hells angels and my motorcycle clubs things like that because they suggested free spiritedness okay and that's how we will get yeah, that's what hollywood new way was all about how it came about now that was also a period when certain cultural revolutions were taking place in america and uh, the music scene who were the people uh, in foreground bob dylan and the doors okay so that's one thing the kind of music they wrote the kind of performances that they excelled in it all suggested a revolution of sorts from what was happening before elvis presley many people quote elvis presley also but he was very tame very orthodox as compared to these people elvis after all apart from his uh, um, dance movements he was quite conservative he upheld the traditional values and beliefs but not bob dylan not the doors so that's the importance of that 
the period, the music of that period. We also had people like Rolling Stones, Mick Jagger, David Bowie and Andy Warhol, the ultimate in cool, okay, in popular culture, in popular art. You know the Campbell soup cans, the entire story, yeah. If you do not know, please do that, the Marilyn, the Elizabeth Taylor prints. Okay. Google Andy Warhol and you will understand. So, that is another name that you should know. In popular culture, now we are talking about pop culture and Andy Warhol. That is an important name. So, influence of these people. So, we are going towards this kind of cinema and we are looking at the socio-political historical context in which new Hollywood cinema can be located. Okay. So, all the, these things are very important when you look at something, if there is a new Hollywood then there has to be a background to it. So, these were the factors that led to the emergence of this new Hollywood. There was not some something radical happening, there was no single factor, but a variety of factors uh, which were all pop, uh, all belong to popular culture, politics as well as uh, um, other things, even, even cinema. So, European cinema was yet another major influence of on new Hollywood cinema. For example, blow up, blow up was a cultural revolution in terms of cinema. Of course, we had eight and half by Fellini, of course, we had Godard, but then blow up by Antonini was his first English movie in English language. It was made in Britain with British actors. Remember that Vanessa Redgrave and yeah, so uh, David Hemmings. So that's the background. And Elfie with Michael Caine. Again, what is Elfie all about? It's about a free-spirited young man of a particular society. Okay, so entire age, the entire movement was influenced in one. If you, if there has to be a takeaway, what is the takeaway? Anti-establishment anti-authoritarian and free spiritedness. Those were the three features that characterized the entire movement. And uh, Vimal would know that from 80s onwards, it was a throwback to the earlier times, 80s onwards when we had cinema of uh, Sylvester Stallone and Schwarzenegger. So, it was actually harking back to the John Wayne category, okay. but in between there was a period which was very radical. And Hollywood, uh, let us be very clear about it, much of uh, the respect that Hollywood enjoys is centered or it emanates from this cinema, this particular period, the so called new Hollywood cinema, the 10, 15 years of excellence in cinema. Okay, so, golden age, yes, Otto Preminger, yes, okay, very important, Hitchcock, Billy Wilder, they were always there, but then after that there was a lull. And what caused what brought about that lull, those are also the factors that we will be looking at. Okay, now, political causes that led to the emergence of new Hollywood cinema, people were feeling uh, a kind of unrest with the political system, the war in Vietnam and there were protests against the war, lots of anti-war feelings. You should also know the demo, something about the uh, 1968 Democratic Convention in Chicago, where students came out uh, in university campuses and protested against many of the U.S. foreign policies. Major political assassinations: Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy. So that's Robert Kennedy. And then Stonewall riots, uh, also JFK, but that came before. Robert Kennedy was in late 60s, along with Martin Luther King, back to back, two major political assassinations. So, what were, what did they uh, suggest? What did they sub symbolize? Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther. What did they stand for? Yeah, liberalism. Okay. And there are regressive forces which do not want liberals to take forth or take the center stage. 
that is the idea. Therefore, they have to be eliminated and assassinated. So, the mo this entire Hollywood new wave cinema was also a response to these things. And of course, you know Stonewall Royds, anti-gay Royds and uh, what happened and we have, we have a response to that also in the form of Dog Day Afternoon. Yes, we have seen that movie. Okay. Now, Hollywood new wave, the immediate fact, I mean, causes, of course, there were socio political and cultural causes, but the immediate factor was of course, money like most of the time. And the reason was that in the mid 60s, because of the invasion and proliferation of so many television channels, television be, uh, became very big that time. Okay. So, my, people chose to stay at home and watch films at home instead of going out to the theatres. So, US, in US theatre attendance was declining fast. So, the filmmakers wanted to give them something new, give the public, bring the public back to the theatres. What do they give them? What can inspire, what can motivate these people to come back to the theatres? That is the idea. And what was the reason why people did not want to go to the theatres anymore? Well, there were mindless star vehicles just you know putting uh, together a bunch of stars and making a movie around them okay without much uh, attention to the narrative the plot the acting style but it was just like that musicals for example dr doolittle which uh, followed that tremendous success of my fair lady starring again rex harrison so, dr doolittle not eddie murphy but rex harrison version of it which bombed badly bloated epics for example cleopatra okay so these were the things and cleopatra almost uh, led to the closing down of 20th century fox studio it was such a big debacle so studios were sinking and what happens when studios are sinking the producers thought that we have to think of new way of storytelling give chance to newer people new actors new directors and experiment with new forms of storytelling, new forms of movies. So, that was the idea and they started looking towards Europe. Okay, there is a revolution happening in Europe, there is Fellaini, okay, there is a movie called La Ventura, where nothing actually happens, but it became big. Blow up, what is the plot of blow up? We do not know. Well, you can think about it, but there is no story as such much of it is in style. So, they thought why not focus on style okay? and uh, gives audience something to think over without telling them too much or giving them too much of melodrama. So, that was the idea. Another major influence was development in science and technology and there were people documentary specialists who practiced something called cinema verite that means real life cinema realistic cinema, verite is real. Hmm? So, these people Richard Leacock, Penn Baker and the Maisel brothers, what did they do? They developed cheap, lightweight and easily accessible equipments. And what did this lead to? What Godard did okay? and what uh, uh, people like Vittorio da Sicha did in Bicycle Thieves. They could take these equipments out of the studios and shoot real people and real life on streets. Okay, so, development of lightweight equipments. So, new Hollywood cinema just did not happen in a vacuum. There were socio, political, cultural reasons also, technical causes and political causes so, it was a combination of several factors that led to the emergence of the so called new wave Hollywood cinema. Otherwise, we would not have a movie like Easy Rider. Okay, if big movies, big budgeted movies, big star vehicles were still doing well, then why do you need to invest in a movie like Easy Rider? Okay, that is the thing. So, Easy Rider is at the center of the entire movement. Now, there was also a movie which came a few uh, months before Easy Rider and it is called Bonnie and Clyde. We have already talked about it and because of its anti-authoritarian, anti-establishment theme, it 
came as a shock to the system. Andrew Saris, who we have already discussed, he referred to the movie as cinema of alienation, anime, anarchy and absurdism, but all these things in very positive context. And who was Arthur Penn? The director and he famously said, we are in the Vietnam war and that is the way movies have to be made. This film cannot be immaculate and sanitized and bang bang, it has to be bloody. And why should it be bloody? reflects the sentiments of that period. Okay, so, you cannot just have a gunshot, uh, you just hear a gunshot somewhere in on screen and then see a long take, a long shot of a dead body without any blood. That is how murders would be shot on screen. You were talking about Laura and Otto Preminger, it is about a murder that happens. Okay, Laura is supposedly murdered, you never see any dead body, you never see any bloodshed. You, know, you do not, you just hear a gunshot going somewhere, okay, that was the maximum violence. The Big Sleep was com considered a very violent movie for its times, Howard Hawks, The Big Sleep, but where, where is the blood there? So, here the movies cannot afford to be sanitized anymore, why? Af after all there were uh, world wars, world, the first world war, second world war, then also, so America had been through serious bloodshed. All these movies were in, way, in one way a response to the Vietnam or Taxi Driver, me, um, de, uh, Deer Hunter, Apocalypse now of course, goes to the heart of the action. So, this is the movie 1967, Bonnie and Clyde, Warren Beatty, Faye Dunaway, directed by Arthur Penn, Robert Town worked on the screenplay of Bonnie and Clyde. At the same time, you also had a movie like The Graduate, again extremely anti-authoritarian starring Dustin Hoffman and Bancroft, directed by Mike Nichols. The first wave directors, here you see a still of the great, which director is he? John Cassavetes, hmm? he was also an actor. He was the leading man in which movie? Hmm? Rosemary's Baby. Okay. Yeah. So the first wave directors. Here is a list, and it's a Hall of Fame-like list. Peter Bogdanovich. We'll talk about him. We have already discussed Francis Ford Coppola extensively, The Godfather. Dennis Hopper, Peter Fonda, Easy Rider. John Cassavetes, several movies which need attention, Arthur Penn, Mike Nichols and Kubrick. So, this there were two waves of new Hollywood cinema directors, this is the first wave. Second wave of course, you know Scorsese at the forefront. Cassavetes for example, in one way became a mentor to Scorsese, he was the one who encouraged him to go on. When he first watched his movie, uh, who is that knocking at the door? Okay, now, what was happening here in the new Hollywood scenario? Directors rather than studios or producers or stars, directors enjoyed more power, more prestige and consequently greater wealth. So, the attention was now on the directors and they did not call themselves just directors, they were not metteurassiens. Remember those words? Metteurassiens, just putting together a scene, but they become authors. So, they prided themselves on becoming authors. Therefore, they assume the mantle of the artist, they are not, not merely Mathieu Ensemble. Developed personal styles distinct from that of other directors and this is something you will find, like we have been talking about authorism in Hitchcock extensively. You have to understand that authorism always existed, but here it was taken to another level, because greater degree of freedom existed. Now, Bonnie and Clyde, it needs some attention and the story was origin, it is a real life story. There were bank robbers called Bonnie and Clyde during the depression era and uh, this story appeared in a magazine called Esquire, which is still in circulation, 
by Robert Benton and David Newman, Bonnie Parker and Clyde Barrow. And the story, uh, the screenplay was uh, uh, much appreciated by Warren Beatty, who also wanted to produce the film and therefore, he was in, co in conflict with Warren brother, Warner Brothers, because uh, uh, Warner Brothers till that time were not used to having uh, told what to do. But then Warren Beatty convinced them this is a, that this is a new kind of a story which needs to be told using new technology. So, all those things that we have been talking about shooting on locations, uh, handheld cameras, showing lot of blood and gore and violence, graphic violence on screen. So, BT somehow convinced uh, Warner Brothers that uh, this movie needs to be produced, but then they said that we will pay you very little for this. He said fine, I will take, I will have a share in the profits of the movie and they naturally thought that anyway this movie is not going to make any profit. So, they signed away the profits of the movies to the actor and then we all know what happened later. If the movie became a huge hit, phenomenal hit, Warren Beatty became an iconic figure. So, they were bank robbers and most of the casting was done from New York as opposed to from Hollywood, a standard Hollywood assembly line uh, productions. Violence was extremely real life real life like very similitude. And uh, one allegation and part of its charm was that it brazenly romanticizes the outlaws, the misfits, the robbers and killers. Remember Bonnie and Clyde are robbers and killers. Later on Oliver Stone paid homage to this movie in the form of natural born killers. Uh, this was the first time when audiences watched blasting holes on the screen okay. and uh, there is a scene because the movie followed Robert Kennedy's assassination. Okay. His assassination had just happened and when at the end in the climactic shootout when Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway are killed on screen by the cops, we actually see Warren Beatty's head, part of his head shot off. That some kind, that kind of violence had never been shown on a screen before. Hero's head being shot off, a part of it. How graphic could that be? Think of that. So initially, when the movie was first released, it was absolutely trashed by uh, the right-wing critics like Bosley Crowther. He was a critic for the New York Times, and he had a thing against violence on screen. And he tried the movie. He, you, um, if you just uh, look uh, look up the criticism on the net, then you will find uh, you you will see the language he uses for the movie. However, another esteemed critic, Pauline Keel, she helped revive its fortunes, its prospects. So the movie was re-released, and then it went on to become a blockbuster because Pauline Keel liked the movie a lot, and she. But see, so that is the reason early in one of our earlier classes we have been talking about how important film writing could be, writing about films. So, somehow you can perhaps think of a career in uh, film writing okay. and it is a very prestigious, very important, you are not just doing some kind of a service to anyone. Okay. You are actually doing a very academic job, if you writing is your thing, then film writing uh, is a very serious profession. And that is why we have so much respect for people like Roger Ebert <coughs> and um, David Thompson and David Bordwell and Pauline Keel, who raised the uh, you know profession of criticism and film writing to the level of art. A little before Bonnie and Clyde, you have a movie called A Hard Day's Night. I think we have done excerpt from this movie also, The Beatles Picture, directed by Richard Lester. So, this movie in a way become, became a precursor to the entire movement, starring the Beatles as themselves. The Beatles picture, why was it impo important? Because it was the kind of movie that defied genres. It is not a musical, 
it has music, but it is not a musical uh, just to be a vehicle for the Beatles, it is not. The Beatles who were already a publicity phenomenon starred in it. And again like all new wave cinema, it was extremely anti-authoritarian, something that people like Truffaut had taught us in 400 blows, Godard had told us in Breathless. Okay, so, it was continuing in the same tradition. The film is irreverent, you have seen how they treat their manager okay, and all the uh, older people in the movie. Extremely joyous, they are being themselves and it is extremely original. Okay. There has never been any movie like that before. There were Elvis Presley movies, musicals, but they are all extremely tame, not in the same vein. Okay. So, uh, A Hard Day's Night is also known for its immortal music. I do not know how many of you are into popular culture and Beatles, but yeah, the movie, the songs are absolutely on top. And Richard Lester is credited for reinventing the grammar of cinema. And we, but by grammar of cinema, again we mean the same things, classic Hollywood. So, there has to be a plot, character, strong focus on characterization. There has to be a narrative. What narrative, Vimal? What linear narrative and continuity editing, remember? But in Easy Rider, as you just watched, how many of you watched? Uh, or paid attention to the fact that editing was not linear, there were jumps there, so, so called jump cuts. Why? Who did the cinematography? Laszlo Kovacs, you should know that name, okay, Laszlo Kovacs. Okay, so, uh, you have things like the movie has documentary look, something which was unheard of till then used handheld cameras and so much of uh, shooting was done on location, quick cutting, overlapping of dialogues, intercutting of dialogues. The Beatles are always interviewed on the run and they are chased by fans as they are running on the streets. And music is a, under documentary action. So, it is almost like it is a documentary on Beatles, but it is not, but it the feel is that as if it is a documentary and it is shot in black and white in the times of color. So, that is the, about the background that uh, two major movies that heralded this new wave Hollywood cinema. One was A Hard Day's Night and much more graphic, much more forceful Bonnie and Clyde. Now, from here we come to key people of new Hollywood period, BBS three names, producer Bert Schneider. Now, usually in this course, we have not been talking about pro producers all that much, right? We talked about a studio system, we also call, talked about to an extent uh, Cecil DeMille, or we, yes, uh, David Selznick, Gone with the Wind. So, we have been talking about some studio Mughals, but we have not been talking too much about producers and how important producers were in fostering the new Hollywood wave. So, Bert Schneider is at the top, he was a producer and they had a company called Raybert Films which produced Easy Rider. Bob Raffelson was his creative head and all his partner, his friend and also director, Steve Blonner. So, BBS comes from Bird, Bob and Steve. BBS, it was a company that enabled directors to make the kind of films they want to without interfering and without trying to control them creatively. So, they are often credited for ushering in the cinematic renaissance of the 60s. So, BBS is a name that you should remember. The great Bert Schneider, very colorful personality, known for several things, ex extremely innovative, extremely bold. So, Bert Schneider who won the Academy Award for making the best documentary, uh, recently passed away in 2011 
and uh, came into the limelight with his production of Easy Rider. Bert Schneider had originally made his money uh, by producing a television series called The Monkeys, which was based along the same lines as uh, A Hard Day's Night. It was a musical television serial starring four young men who would sing songs and their lives almost in the same way as the Beatles. They were called the monkeys and it was a smash hit and they made pots of money from the monkeys and then went on to produce some serious cinema. So, what, what did they do? They uh, encouraged the kind of cinema that uh, demanded improvisation, breakdown of the linear editing system, quite Brechtian by the way they broke the fourth wall and free flowing loose narratives. Did you find that in Easy Rider, free flowing narrative? Is there a narrative in Easy Rider? You have watched the movie, Vimal. Is there a, focus on him please. Is there a, a narrative in Easy Rider? How much of it? I mean, is there a very strong plot? Is it plot driven? Well, in terms of narrative closure, maybe not. Well, it is a road movie. Okay. You can't say that Easy Rider has a narrative because they never had a screenplay of that movie. Okay. It was all improvised, done on location. They did not know what they were doing. Okay, they would just go shoot a lot of stuff on streets and then at the end Bert Schneider sat down and edited it out. Okay, and the kind of movie that we see, if there is a plot, it is thanks to Bert Schneider's efforts, not because of Dennis Hopper. Okay, so, Bert Schneider, the producer did the editing. He was an extremely talented person and he took the, he took complete control over the movie because Dennis Hopper obviously was not uh, in you know, that balanced enough to do uh, take control of such a monumental task like editing and Bert Schneider did it. So, that you feel that there is a plot, but the fact is that there was no story, no screenplay, they worked without any screenplay. Although in the titles you find that three people are credited with the story, Peter Fonda, Dennis Hopper, Terry Southern, they must have done something, they must have thrown around a bit of ideas here and there, but there was no screenplay. <coughs> so, fluidity that is what we are talking about, flu, fluidity and free flowing narrative, which was again that was pioneered by European filmmakers. Uh, by the same logic, I can even uh, uh, tell you that breathless does not have a narrative, it does not have a closure, it does not have a narrative, it just flows. It uh, yeah, Basically, style is at the center okay, rather than plot. It is more about uh, the kind of signature that you will leave behind rather than creating a story, unlike the Howard Hawks of the world, who pe people who were extremely talented, but they, they were told to do a story. Okay, this is a story, stick to this screenplay, make a movie out of it. New wave directors did not believe in that. It may appear very shocking to you, how such great cinema came out of such indiscipline, but that was the kind that was part of their, uh, you know, innovations. Okay, and BBS then went on to direct a list of uh, great films of the Hollywood New Wave era. Some of the most important fi films of this period are, of course, Easy R Rider, Head, which was directed by Bob Raffelson, Lost and Found. Five easy pieces starring who? Jack Nicholson. It's very European in nature. Drive, he said, directed by who? Drive, he said, directed by Jack Nicholson. Hmm. A safe place, the last picture show. We are going to talk about the film, The King of Marvin Gardens. So, that is the BBS list very avant-garde, very experimental kind of cinema. And when you get your Coppola's and when you get your Scorsese's and someone like Peter Bogdanovich, then you have to credit the BBS people for this. 
they were the one who started. It was also the period when we had a movie by John Boorman, Point Blank, 1967, and surprisingly, a very violent movie from the stable from the house of MGM. It begins with a shot of a battered and almost dead Lee Marvin. It is extremely brutal, very oblique and most unlike any movie that came out of any old studio system. But that was a period when the studio had thought that we have to encourage this sort of cinema in order to survive. Therefore, a movie like Point Blank came out. So, even old guard started rethinking, renewing their strategies, that is the idea. Kubrick's 2001, if you have watched the movie, you will know what I am trying to tell you, Ex extremely avant-gardish. Is there a plot? I am talking about the plot that we were used to in the golden age of Hollywood. Do you get that kind of plot in Easy Rider or Drive, he said, or 2001 or Space Odyssey? You do not. It's, um, we are, remember cause and effect, cause and effect, always go back to that. Do you find that cause and effect thing here? Forget the closure, of course, there was no closure in all these movies, but things did not happen because of that cause and effect model, a complete disintegration of that earlier model. Therefore, golden age is golden age because there was, there were strong stories, emphasis on narratives and plot, not here. Kasavetis. So, Faces is his important movie and A Woman Under the Influence, yet another great movie by Kasavetis. New Hollywood cinema characterized by growth of independent, the so called indie cinema, right Vimal? You keep on talking about indie cinema. So, power shifted from the studio to directors, less to the actors, but more to directors and emergence of something called the road movie coming literally coming out of the folds of the studio. Another feature, now we were talking about editing. So, old Hollywood linear editing, new Hollywood non-linear editing, discontinuous editing. So, fast motion, slow motion, long takes, jump cuts and you just watch the clipping from Easy Rider, where you have lots of that watch, the scene of the wrist watch on the ground, what is that all about? How did that come about? Jump cut. We will go back to that scene later on in the movie. So, watch the film. So, editing was no longer unobtrusive, but called attention to itself. An emphasis on sync sound method, that is recording the sound while filming the picture and not dubbing. In India, for a long time we had dubbing and we also had dubbing artists. Heroines, they just look pretty, but they cannot speak, they have no sense of dialogue delivery. So, you use them for their dancing skills and for their beauty and get the dialogues dubbed. Anyway, they did not have much to do in the movie. So, a dubbing artist would dub all their dialogues. So, that was something that uh, continued for a very long time. Okay, Clute by Ellen J. Pacula, 1971, Jane Fonda, Donald Sutherland. So, those were the stars of that period and again it deals with the theme and Voyeurism and theme of surveillance becomes very important in new Hollywood cinema. Why surveillance is so important? Vimal, can you tell me? You are scared. Okay. It was there to an extent, Cold War and all, but he is thinking of that. But one very immediate factor, Watergate, Watergate scandal. Okay. So, therefore, paranoia in American society, all of us are being spied on. So, voyeurism, surveillance, avoidance of closure, satisfactory closure, openness, ambiguity even about characters. So, no more good and bad people, but very morally ambiguous people.
that is something you find even in Hitchcock, but now more and more widespread, more and more common. Conversation by Coppola, again along the same lines, Coppola was following, it is one of his most personal films. So, he was following the Watergate break in scandal and deals with the theme of surveillance. Gene Hackman is Harry Call and movie is again less about plot and more of a character study of the man. It is about him and what he goes through the alienation of a man whose job is to spy on others, that is all. The famous toilet flushing scene is a homage to the shower scene in Psycho. Have you seen the conversation? Have you? Okay, so, we are told that a murder is taking place in the hotel room next door to Harry's. He does not want to interfere, he does not try to uh, stop the murder. Later on, much later when he enters that same room and flushes the toilet, it overflows with blood and that is a very shocking image. Another important, important director of that period, Mike Nichols, first major film, successful film was Who is Afraid of Virginia Woolf, Burton Taylor, based on Edward Elby's play. He became a hot shot director following the success of The Graduate. And then carnal knowledge with Jack Nicholson and Candice Bergen. He also made a very unsuccessful uh, adaptation of Catch 22, Joseph Heller's novel. The movie is Catch 22, but it did not do well. Why did not it do well? Because it was released simultaneously with Robert Altman's MASH. And look at the way MASH deals with war and uh, Cash 22 is quite tame as compared to the complete irreverence, irre, uh, irreverent treatment of MASH. Peter Bogdanovich, another important very influential director of that period, he is also film writer and a scholar and who the devil made it, it is uh, an, an, an anthology of interviews with Orson Welles. John Ford and Howard Hawks. You know these people, right? By now you know all these names. He wrote a book called John Ford, it is a biography and a study of John Ford's works, 1978, <coughs> and this is Orson Welles, 1992. So, books by Peter Bogdanovich, who is best remembered for his The Last Picture Show, Jeff Bridges and Sybil Shepherd. So, early works by Peter Bogdanovich, they include, he actually collaborated with uh, Roger Corman, who was uh, a legendary B movie filmmaker on the Wild Angels, we were just talking about it, starring Peter Fonda, John Wayne of the biker flicks. Uh, he debuted with a thriller, Targets, about a mad sniper and an aging horror film star played by Boris Karloff. So, those were the earlier works. Before the last picture show, we had the wild angels on which he um, worked on the script of the movie and then directed targets. What is it all about? It is shot in black and white, it is a 1971 movie shot in black and white. Why do you think Bogdanovich uses black and white tone for the movie? Maybe, I do not think the movie talks about life in 1971. No. So, maybe it is a homage to the era in which the movie is filmed. It is a throwback, it is a nostalgic piece. Therefore, perhaps he needed that kind of look. It is set during the depression era, hmm? theatres are closing down and the movie ends on a very sad, very uh, haunting note, which is the last picture they watch. The closing down of the only film theatre in that small town of Arlene in Texas. The things are so bad that they have to shut down the only theatre and this theatre was once upon a time a haven, a place for escaping, but now things have become so bad that they have to close down the theatre 
the last picture show. Which is the last picture they get to watch? The Red River by Howard Hawks. Again, this is a homage by a fan, Peter Bogdanovich to Howard Hawks. Red River is starring John Wayne and Monty Clift. So, shot in black and white and the movie has a very sparse, very dusty look. If you watch it, it is not at all a pretty picture. Yeah, it says a lot of serious things. Basically, it is like a, a, that coming of age movie, but then it is a, it's a very sad, very sombre take on coming of age thing. And of course, it has Peter Bogdanovich was, was, was belonged to that group of directors who were heavily influenced by the European style of filmmaking. So, themes of loss and alienation, again you find this in this movie as well. Peter Bogdanovich's other successes included What's Up Doc, it is a comedy, Barbara Streisand and Ryan O'Neill, Paper Moon, real life father daughter combination Ryan and Tatum O'Neill. Tatum O'Neill became really big after this movie. She was called on stage to present the Academy Awards to Robert De Niro for Raging Bull. I am sorry, not for Raging Bull, for uh, the second godfather, yes. Peter Bogdanovich went through a very bad patch, but are you familiar with this movie? The Cat's Mio. Uh, it is like you know gaining some lost ground, but happened much later in 2001. The Cat's Mio starring a very young Kirsten Dunst and it is a piece of historical conjecture where uh, William Hurst, you remember William Hurst from our Citizen Kane, yeah. So, he is on a yacht where he has a group of celebrity guests including Loella Parson and Charlie Chaplin. They are going um, for a just getaway to Catalina and then there is a murder on yacht. So, it is a mix of comedy as well as suspense thrillers uh, in the Hitchcockian mold. Kirsten Dunst in the cat's meow. So, that is Peter Bogdanovich for you and then Robert Altman. Robert Altman known for MASH, you can look at the still extremely irreverent and anti-authoritarian. Just look at the still very closely. And then there was another great movie, Macab and Mrs. Miller starring Warren Beatty and Julie Christie, a British actress. Altman's most prestigious movie is Nashville. It is an ensemble cast, it is a musical and it is also an extremely political movie without explicitly stating its politics. So, Nashville. So, those are the three must watch of Robert Altman, Nashville, Macab and Mrs. Miller. Do you know the story of Macab and Mrs. Miller? The hero is a gambler, the heroine runs a brothel and it is set in uh, 19th century. So, it, the movie was shot extensively on location in Vancouver and uh, they would have all these snowstorms and Warren Beatty would insist on several retakes throughout the movie. At the end, the story demands that he be killed and he is shown buried in snow and Robert Altman wanted to have his final revenge on Warren Beatty and he called for 31 retakes for that shot. Because throughout the movie, Warren Beatty had been demanding too many retakes. No, I am not satisfied with this shot. Let us redo it all over again. So, he drove Robert Altman crazy with his demand, persistent demand for so called perfection, you know, actor's vanity. He was huge after uh, Bonnie and Clyde. Okay, so, Robert Altman had his sweet revenge and when Warren Beatty had to shoot, uh, shoot his uh, death scene buried under snow, he made him go through any number of retakes. He said, no, I am not satisfied with this, let us redo it again. <laughs> after that, Beatty I am sure never demanded a retake. Okay. 
the movie uh, was critically acclaimed, but did not do very well, but today it is an iconic movie, a cult classic. So, at this point we end and we will meet now next week. Thank you very much.